I, in the past, have made unwise decisions. One of those unwise decisions is joining a, like, men's Christian group on Facebook. And for the most part, for the most part, I just kind of spectate on the nonsense that goes on in there. But occasionally, something comes along and I have to weigh in on it. And it was a subject of discussion that asked why it is that Christians have idols, specifically the image of the cross. Why is it that Christians have these idols that they wear, let's say, on their clothing, etc., on chains, in their homes, on their walls, on their churches and steeples? Why do Christians do this? It's clearly idolatrous and um, a breach of the second commandment right? And so let me grant what I can in order to be gracious as I possibly can in that anything, whether it's a symbol or a person or an idea, can become an idol for sure. Uh, literally meaning graven image. Anything can be an idol. Anything can become idolized or take an unhealthy position in a person's heart or mind. Of course it can. And so, um, are there Christians out there that have venerated the image of the cross in a spiritually maybe, um, violated fashion? Maybe, probably even. Does that mean that all Christians everywhere are doing that and have always done that? No, obviously no. Well, let's talk about where it comes from. So, initially, nobody wore an image of the cross. No one would have put such a thing on their homes or in their places of worship. Nobody would have done any of those things because of the fact it was and remains one of the most horrendous forms of execution that mankind has ever developed. Um, invented originally by the Persians, was most certainly perfected by the Romans as a means of torturing dissidents to death. And it was incredibly effective at doing so. And it, its effectiveness is in kind of multifold fashion. First of all, it put dissidents to death, which was its intention. And it did so in an incredibly painful, arduous fashion that prolonged their suffering as long as humanly possible. And so it became a symbol of the most painful way, honestly, that a person could die, that a person could imagine dying. It was the form is basically torture and execution all in one. The second thing is that most often when a person was crucified, for whatever reason they happened to have been so, that they would have a sign either hung around their neck maybe or nailed to the top like you see many Christian crosses happen to have now or uh, maybe laid at the foot or at the head of a long sequence of crucifixions that took place at the same time, declaring what the crime was this person had been found guilty of so that it would, let's say, persuade others not to join their cause, not to perform or behave in a similar manner, whether that was the crime of theft or um, an uprising against Roman or Persian rule, whether that, like, there's a lot of reasons and causes. For instance, that Spartacus and his army during the Third Servile War in uh, Roman history, uh, supposedly 6,000 of them were crucified on the same day by Mar Marcus Crassus. And uh, in another instance, a Jewish uprising that failed, some thousand or more uh, Jews, men and women, were crucified all at once between two cities, basically, um, you might want to say like for every telephone pole that you would see on the highway as you're driving from one city to another, imagine a decaying, screaming, 
arduous, agonizing person was nailed to that and just solely um, being exposed to death, asphyxiating himself in plain view. And that's another aspect of it is the shame, the humiliation. Most were crucified completely naked, exposed to the sunlight, any passing animals um, that decided to want to take advantage of the situation. And so it was an object of shame being, ready, being heaped upon this individual aside from simply the pain and torture and, and ultimate death that they were suffering. It was considered in this way to be so horrendous, so undignified, that Roman citizens were actually exempt from it. And whereas women were at times crucified, they were mostly exempt from it as well because it was considered too dishonorable for them as the, um, the fairer sex to be subjected to it. And in the event when a woman was subjected to such a tormentous death, they were usually nailed with their face towards the spike or towards the cross itself to not have to look them in the eye as they suffered. Because of this, because of all these features that surrounded this unfortunate um, reality of the past, nobody l even discussed, talked about, or would have been seen with a symbol uh, representative of a cross or of a crucifixion until roughly three centuries after the last one had been performed and the practice had been outlawed because it took that long for the collective memory and its subsequent kind of communal trauma to subside enough where people could begin to affix to this icon, this symbol, this image a different meaning and one of the first to come along and do so was a man named Saint John of the Cross and he's called that because of his association with this symbol that he became very um, let's say passionately focused on death and that he is known for being one of the first to ever put crosses in his decor he would put them he had an entire room where basically they were just all over the place inside like it was a Hobby Lobby section of crosses because his idea is that he wanted to keep what was called uh, the spiritual practice of mortification literally meaning to die uh, in front of his face and it's a Christian practice to do so anyway uh, it's something that Charles Spurgeon and C.S. Lewis and various other Christian authors etc have talked about but the mortification of the flesh for the purpose of spiritual purity, that without holiness no man can see God, and therefore it is necessary for a person to put the idea of death before themselves. Jonathan Edwards, in one of his resolutions, said that he will seek to keep the idea of death before himself as much as possible so that when the day comes that he should face death, he will be familiar to it. Um, and so it's a very Christian concept, and so this symbol, the cross, became a means of displaying that. And that he is also known, St. John of the Cross is, for even having used open human skulls for drinking and eating vessels because he wanted to keep that even his nursing of his bodily needs he wanted it to be surrounded and inculcated with images of death and that he had skulls and stuff that he used as icons as well and so that's kind of where we see this thread starting to come into Christian practice but it really wouldn't become widespread until the interactions that Christians would begin to have with Muslims in the Middle Ages because of the fact that anytime you need to um, galvanize a military force which at that time the Crusader forces would have been 
conglomerates of various different nations, which may or may not have been on friendly terms, so a single national banner would not have been sufficient to be able to unite them. They needed something else, and so they settled on the cross as their symbol for two reasons. One is that if you hold a sword up with its point downwards, it looks like a cross. And that so, like, when a soldier would die, they would place even sometimes his sword in the soil to mark the place where he had fallen. It became a very common motif. That's one of the, actually, the sources for using a cross as a grave marker, even, that if you think about during World War II, where they would take and they would stick a man's rifle into the dirt above his corpse that had been buried with his helmet on it, that icon, it's that same basic idea. And often a lot of the reinforcing markers that were used for strengthening armor, just by nature of the fact that the cross is a very strong um, structural symbol, ended up being a very common motif across like the nose bridges of helmets and such, or over the shoulder plates. And so it was all over their armor to begin with. And so it just became a very common galvanizing symbolic image in which to unite the armies of Europe against the incursions of the Muslims who marched under a crescent and star from the east because the Muslims were trying to conquer a roadway into Jerusalem because, of course, the, one of the five pillars of Islam is pilgrimage, and it mostly centers around Medina and Mecca. But, of course, that's not where Abraham lived, who they as as ascribe as being their father, he lived in Israel, so they wanted a pathway into Israel in order to acquire that pathway into Israel and to conquer the fortress of Jerusalem. They needed Antioch and the Byzantine Christian Empire, of course, was off a imminent threat against them. And so you have these two warring factions against each other, each with their own unique symbol, the cross and the, cres the crescent star. It became a common motif to put crosses on the tops of steeples or on the tops of minarets throughout the Middle East as a symbol to indicate where pilgrim in, pilgrims in travel could find respite and friendly uh, fellowship, where they could find resources and safety. So you would begin to see across the landscape of the Middle East, you'd have certain cities that would have all these crescent stars begin to pop up, and then you'd have all these crosses begin to raise up as well to indicate the allegiance of that particular town, village, or army. And that's where it really began. And it has lost a lot of that kind of militaristic essence to it, of course, over time. But it is still a symbol for the purpose of identifying Christians in the marketplace. That's what it's intended to be. Is it still that? Not necessarily. But getting back to our central question, is it idolatrous? And again, the answer is it can be, but not inherently. And so it's up to you as a Christian to check yourself and your heart and to see where you are in regards to all of this. Because if you're not idolizing it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's what uh, in Hebrews and Peter and uh, Paul writing in the New Testament wrote that to the pure, all things are pure. But to the impure, all things are impure.